a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview. Welcome to the 81st episode of Curiosityness. I am Travis DeRose, the host of this show where we talk about interesting topics and things and people. And today I got an interesting people on, Charles Phoenix, the ambassador of Americana, the king of kitsch. Wow, it sounds like a intro from Space Jam. But Charles Phoenix is awesome. He was so fun to talk to. He's like a mid-century modern pop culture expert. He has these uh, shows where he shows slides and talks about those. So he's just, he's a funny, fun guy to talk about who just is like super retro and talks about all these things. So, um, you know, we kind of dive into that and uh, (laughs) we talk about his books, Addicted to Americana and Holiday Jubilee and something called the Trapumple, which is like, I'll just let him describe it, but it's exciting. Um, so I think you'll like this episode. It's We dig into kind of fun places in L.A. and Long Beach where I live and uh, talk about how to find interesting places wherever you go of like mom and pop shops and different things like that. And we're also doing a giveaway. We're giving away Charles Phoenix's book, Addicted to Americana, which you can find at curiositynest.com slash giveaway, or the link will be down in the description for you to click on. I'll give some more info on that at the end because this is, intro is getting way too long. So let's just get to the episode. Here is Charles Phoenix. Charles Phoenix, what's up? We're on. Yes. Yes, we are on. I don't know. You tell me what's up. Um, here we are. We're, we're rolling. We're here. Man, this. you got a good, you know, radio voice. I've been told. Thank you. I've it, been told. I mean, people tell me that like every day. It's striking. Yeah. I mean, Thanks. it's a gift, I guess. But You have a really good singer, too, don't you? <laughs> well, maybe we'll be gifted with some some songs later, huh? I'm really shy, though. I only... <laughs> I know the best singing is in the car. That is right. where the best singing takes place for sure. I mean, I just sing out like I don't care who sees me or whatever. I mean, no one's paying any attention anyway. So yeah, that's true. Lately, I've been singing "When You Wish Upon a Star" in the car. Okay. I'm sorry that rhymes, but it does. So, <laughs> are the windows down or are they up? No, they're up. I mean, you know, I mean, in today's world, we usually, unless I'm in a classic car and the windows are down. I mean, we have lovely weather here in Southern California. I'm in Los Angeles. I mean, the weather has never been better. It's just been absolutely incredible. So yeah. every day I dream of going out in one of my classic cars. You know, I'm into classic cars, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. You got a bunch yeah. of videos on it. I do. On my Facebook, I have a series called Joyride, which is me featuring outer space age cars, mostly from the late 1950s and the early 60s, which was the pinnacle peak of automotive styling and, you know, Tomorrowland style where cars look like they had a baby with a rocket ship and stuff. I love that. (laughs) I was born on a car lot. The first words out of my mouth were, um, what kind of car is that? (laughs) Words out of my mouth. So I mean. Nice, man. Do you own any cars? Any classic I cars? I, I just got a 58 DeSoto Firefly Tudor hardtop. It's unbelievable. It has 30,000 original miles. And uh, oh. I mean, I love low mileage originals. I love, I mean, I love to go fast like everyone else, but I'm really a style guy. And the style that I like is that outer space age, mid-century modern, you know, fly me to the moon, uh, rocket ship style. That's mm-hmm. what I like. Yeah, I, I said I grew up on a used car lot. I think I just said that. I'm sorry. Now I'm getting repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great, man. Too, like the uh, just the huge fins and stuff. I love that styling. They really, it's gone. What like why don't they do that anymore? Well, it's too expensive. I mean, it's it's you know it's way too expensive. Plus, you know, I mean, basically they were selling optimism in the form of cars. Now you know we've evolved. And now what we sell in the form of a car is a, is really a, a roll carriage on wheels, a drivable roll cage, I meant, a roll carriage. Yeah, roll carriage. Let's call it a roll <laughs> No, I mean, cars now are roll carriages, uh, roll cars, roll, roll, roll. I mean, they're roll, they're, um, what am I trying to say? Roll, you got um, this. Um, roll cages, <laughs> roll cages. They're roll cages. You know what a roll cage is, don't you? No, what's a roll cage? That's when you have a cage that you can roll in and not get hurt. It doesn't crush. 
Oh, okay, right. They're roll cages on wheels. So let's call them roll carriages. They're roll carriages. Okay. That's what they are. They are roll carriages. <laughs> so we gave up styling just so we could be safe, I guess. Well, we gave, we lo- we lost the styling so we could be safe. We oh, lost okay. the styling so we could be safe. I mean, yeah, if you look at like if your viewers, listeners are going to look up a car. I mean, look up a 58 DeSoto. It was made by the Chrysler Corporation. It's a mark that no longer exists. I mean, it's been long gone. Look up 1959 Cadillac. Look up 1959 Chevrolet. Look up 1959 Buick. I mean, you are going to see, like, literally cars that look like they had a baby with a rocket ship. That's what was for sale. So, you know, the mid-century is my muse. I mean, that's my my study in life. That's my... That's kind of my whole thing. I'm studying mid-century American. Wait, what am I stu- studying? Mid-century <laughs> celebrating. Oh, I'm celebrating and studying. But to, in order to celebrate it, I have to study it first. Mid-century American life and style. In fact, you know, I have a couple books. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to get to that yet. But uh, how, uh, what's this one? Oh, yeah. Addicted to Americana. <laughs> so it's it. all everything. I mean, there it is right there. Theme parks and world's fairs, monorails, wienermobiles, hotels, motels, restaurants, driving girls. Mermaids, dinosaurs, space age show cars, giant donuts, muffler men, bowling alleys, coffee shops, Wild West, Tiki, Exotica, strip malls and shopping centers, drive ins, drive throughs, vintage Vegas, electrifying neon signs, and more. Dude. This is, yeah. So I got this, and then recently I did another one, Holiday Jubilee, which celebrates all the holidays. Oh, oh wait, what am I looking at? I'm supposed to be looking at the green dot where I'm sky. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so I'm into it. I mean, I have dedicated my life to celebrating classic and kitschy American life and style. I mean, my main stock and trade until, until like, you know, the pandemic was live slideshows, live retro slideshows on stage. I, I, you know, theaters hire me to come in and I have a show with a big giant screen and I talk about all these discoveries that I've made and I collect other people's old slides. There's ten of them, a ton of them behind me right here. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I've been collecting other people's, uh, oh, there's a rubber band in there. Um, I've been collecting other people's old slides for like since 1992. Damn. And that started as, that started as a result of my addiction to thrift shopping which started when I was 14 in my hometown of Ontario, California. So I found thrift shops to be the perfect place for me to study the underbelly of our mass consumerism culture. I also found museums, schools of style, and museums, museums of merchandise. And also, it was after uh, 16 years of thrift shopping, when I was 30, I discovered a little blue shoe box marked Trip Across the United States 1957, and I opened it up, and there it was. Like, I heard all the angels singing. I saw unicorns flying and rainbows and eternity. It was a box of someone's old slides from their trip across the United States in 1957. So I held it up, and I was holding the slides up, like, looking at them in the thrift store like this. And I'm like, there was all this old, like, space age architecture and their cars with the giant fins and everything, and their clothes were so beautiful. And I just thought, okay, this is a treasure with my name on it, and I've been collecting other people's old slides ever since. Kodachrome slides. Um, do you know what a slide is? You do. I just showed them to you. Yeah. 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 I've never, I've never physically touched one, but, but I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. I mean, it's, it's a medium. I mean, like, you know, we don't have, now everything's digital, so we don't actually touch the, the, you know, the, the image itself, but yeah, right. back in the day you had to touch it like a photograph you hold in your hand. Yeah. This is a little thing that you actually project light through and it goes on a big screen. You have a slideshow in your living room. Yeah. So, but I've taken it to the next level and I have these big giant slideshows in theaters all across the United States. Well, I used to until, until yeah. now. Been shut down for a while here. Yeah. Shut down. But that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Take, take a little break. You, you earned it. What? Uh oh. I, sorry. What? <laughs> no. Well, so uh, I've always wondered, you know, I'll see the boxes of like photos or slides at like a garage sale or the thrift store. I'm like, who? Who's buying other people's photos? You know, why? Who's doing this? But uh, I guess you're the guy who does it. <laughs> I buy the slides, not the photos. I mean, the slides, they're, the quality is so incredible. And that's kind of what takes me to that era, to the mid century American era, is the quality and the design of the goods. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything was such, I mean, there was so much high quality materials used in the production of these highly stylized things from cars to our clothes to products we put around the home, our furniture, I mean, fabrics, textiles, 
Uh, I love the, the, you know, I mean, everything's kind of a little, it's a lot more, well, you know, whether it's factory made or, you know, cottage industry made, whatever it is, the quality is just intense. I mean, like, for example, let's go back to the 1959 Cadillac. I mean, the metal that they used, the finish that they used, all this chrome, and you open up the door and there's like this beautiful leather and brocade interior that's like the colors, everything. Oh, that's the other thing. Everything was so colorful. Yeah. Beyond colorful. Mm -hmm. So I love color. No fear of color. I always say that. That's good. I love color. (laughs) No, it's like, because, you know, I'll watch like older movies or something and they'll they portray the the fifties or sixties as the, you know, these colorful things with all these cars and everything. And I'm like, was it really like that, you know, or is this just idyllic, like a picturesque kind of thing? But I mean, it was kind of like that, wasn't it? It was, I mean, it was the quality of, I mean, the other thing that really, you know, somebody said to me the other day, they said, you really celebrate the middle class. And that's the thing I'm really celebrating. I mean, not to get political or whatever, cause I never really do, but um, what I celebrate I, in the mid-century style and design era um, that I'm in, so into studying and celebrating and sharing on my Instagram and my Facebook and all that and my live shows and books is the quality of the lifestyle for middle class Americans. The pop culture explosion that happened in the United States in the 1950s and 60s is second in scale only to the Big Bang. I mean, <laughs> never. No, really. I mean, it was a pop culture explosion that ha- happened after World War II. I mean, this country went mad with productivity and, and mass consumerism. And the result is just shocking to go back and look at what was being produced and what was being bought and the trends and the fads and, and how it evolved. And, you know, it kind of settled down. Um, I mean, the style kind of you know, got a little earthier as the 60s went on and and then the hippies kind of, you know, their influence was there. And, you know, but there was that time where everything was like, you know, I'm not saying it was a better time than now. I never go there. That's not my thing. I'm just saying it's an interesting time to study is like that pinnacle peak was kind of late 50s, early 60s, Marilyn Monroe singing happy birthday to John F. Kennedy. I mean, that's kind of like the pinnacle peak of fame culture at that time. But um, anyway, it was just, you know, everything was kind of candy coated and so optimistic. The optimism is what intrigues me the most and what interests me the most. And really, what is the touchstone? What's the connectivity for me? Because I'm like, I don't know why, but I was born like completely optimistic. (laughs) That's That's great. Yeah. Can't can't complain about that. I know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like you, because obviously you weren't around then for the late 50s, early 60s, but. Well, I was born December 20th, 1962. So. Okay. So you were there. You, it, that little, counts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Literally just a little. Yeah. Um, okay. But so you've just spent your, you've, I mean, how did you dive into this? You, I mean. Well, okay. I dove into it. I mean, this is, this is kind of how my professional career went. Um, When I was 19, I moved to L.A. from my hometown of Ontario, California, because I wanted to be a fashion designer. I already had, so I decided I wanted to be a fashion designer when I was 14. So 19, I moved to L.A. I got an apartment. I went to school to study fashion design. I went there. After a three-year program, I got this job, and like I lucked into this amazing fashion design job, which led to another one, which led to another one. After nine years of being in the fashion industry in the 80s, in 1992, yeah, it was nine years, um, I decided, you know what, the fashion world is like way too pretentious for me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do what I really want to do. I'm going to buy and sell classic cars. So I, ha- I had grown up on a used car lot, so I kind of had an idea about that. So I bought and sold classic cars. And then it was during the time of buying and selling classic cars when I stumbled upon this box of other people's old slides marked trip across the United States in 1957 in a thrift shop. And then I started collecting the old slides and buying and selling the classic cars. But then I started having slideshows in like libraries and coffee houses and different places around town, shops and stores and stuff on Saturday night or whatever. And all these people started coming and pretty soon, like, well, right off the bat, the first one I ever did, I got a giant article in the Sunday LA Times magazine. And that was really a coup. And because they're like, nobody is, I mean, it was before found photography was a thing. This is mm-hmm. 1998. 
found photography had not become a thing yet. So I started, I just, you know, I kind of blindly with blind faith, just kind of did what I wanted to do and make sure I made sure that I was clever enough to, you know, like somehow find a way to make a living along the way, keep the roof over my head and just kind of, you know, really creativity drove me. And pretty soon I was no longer buying and selling the classic cars, but I was charging 10 bucks to see my show. And then 10 came, became 20 and 30 and whatever. And it just kind of evolved into this thing. I was, I had a, I had a type of show that nobody else had. And so like for 20, how many, 22 years now, I've been able to put the roof over my head just doing that. And, you know, it's been an incredible journey. I've traveled all over the United States. I mean, even to Europe doing it. And um, so it's, I, I get to see places around the United States. I find places in the slides and I like, I want to go and see if that's still there now. So, you know, I go there, like, let's just say Tulsa or, you know, Fort Lauderdale or Portland or Palm Springs or Catalina Island or, you know, I mean, a million places. I've been all over. I haven't been everywhere, but I'm also going in search of what's left over and going in search of where are all the treasures? Mm -hmm. Where are the, where are the leftovers? You know, and I, I find these things. Sometimes I find things in photos and, uh, or, you know, old slides, um, you can call them photos if you want. Um, I find things in old slides and I'm like, I wonder if this still exists. Like no one would have thrown this away, would they? Well, where is it? And so many of these things, like you can find them. I mean, like somebody saved it, that squirreled away somewhere. And I've been invited into amazing private collections and public collections as well in search of Americana, really. I mean, mm -hmm. in search Oh, that's it. So I've been east, west, north, and south, upside down, inside out, and backwards, and lost and found doing <laughs> this. And it's been a great journey. So my retro slideshows live on stage not only show vintage slides, but we also kind of segue back and forth between me going in search of all of these things. Like there's some monorail cars and, and some classic cars and, and just different things. I mean, there's just too many things to mention what I go in search of, but, and then what kind of happens along the way. I also like when I travel to go to like a town, like if I hit Atlanta or, or, you know, wherever I am, Detroit or, um, Boise, Idaho or wherever, I want to go in search of all of the heritage businesses there. Like the oldest hamburger stand, is there an old candy store? Is there an old bowling alley? Where are all the vintage neon signs? Are there any still left up working? Um, so I'm always going in search of, that kind of core of the classic, you know, just things to find and, and oddball collections and stuff. So I'm really good at ferreting the stuff out and knowing kind of who to ask the right questions, where to really find, you know, who has what. I'll never forget. I was driving from. Am I talking too much? No, this is great. Keep on. Okay. Keep it going. I was driving from. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I was driving from Texas. I bought a classic car in Texas and I was driving all the way across Texas to drive it home to California. This is just a few years ago. And I was in the small, tiny town called Pecos, Texas. It's an oil town out in the middle of nowhere in Texas. And the car started to like give me attitude. So I thought, uh Oh, something's wrong with this car. This is a small town. I don't know any mechanics. I know what I'm going to do. I can drive around. I need to get this fixed now. I mean, I don't have time. I mean, I'm on the road. I need to fix now. So mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to find somebody with a classic car mm -hmm. and I'm going to find them. I'm going to find a classic car, find the owner and say, you know, you've got a classic car. I do too. Who can fix mine right now? Right. And so okay. I drove around town. As a matter of fact, it was the only place I could find a classic car was in the parking lot of the country club. <laughs> and so I drove, I walked in the country club of this totally like out in the middle of nowhere town and the Pecos, like Texas Country Club. And I, everyone was eating dinner at these long tables and I walked in the door. And as I always say, everywhere I ever enter, when any time I travel, I walk and go into these places, whatever kind of establishment it is, the first words out of my mouth always are, I'm an out of towner. <laughs> okay. So I'm an out of towner. People swarm to help you. Really? Okay. They do. I mean, it, the psychology of those words is powerful. I'm an out-of-towner. So um, I said, I'm an out-of-towner, and I have a classic car, a 1966 Cadillac, and, it, and it's, it's got some problems, and I need somebody to help me. Who owns the Riviera in the parking lot? 
and everyone drops their four. They look up and they're all dropping their four. And somebody says, I do. Well, not only did they fix my car the next morning, it turns out the guy has this incredible collection of classic cars and all kinds of mid-century memorabilia in a former Woolworths store. Woolworths was like um, the 99 cent store of its day. So in the old rundown, blown out downtown of Pecos, Texas, there was this old Woolworths five and dime store, the 99 cent store of its day. And it was full of his entire car collection. So while we looked at the Whoa. car collection, the car got fixed. So anyway, I mean, you never know what you're going to run into. I mean, if you know what you're looking for and you go in search of it, I mean, it's not only are you going to find what you're looking for, you are going to find an amazing journey along the way. Dude. So goals are important in life. I mean, that's I'm segueing to another topic. But at that point, my goal was to fix this car. So it doesn't matter what your goal is. I just I always I realize more and more goals are so important. And it's not only reaching the goal, but it's just like kind of like, you know, the roadmap along the way that you you go on to get there. I mean, it, it really becomes a journey. But if you have a goal, it's like climbing a mountain. You know, it's like that's the top of the mountain and I'm here now, but I'm going to get up there. OK, how do I do that? Well, one foot in front of the other, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Way. So, you know, and if you don't quite get there, maybe you'll find something else along the way. So goals are important. Goals, 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 goals. OK, wow. We're getting life lessons here even. Well, I mean, I don't know. We're just we're just having a conversation. No, this is great. OK, so let's say you're, you, you know, you're rolling into kind of a, a new town you've never been. What's how do you find, you know, these places? What's your, your well, process? <laughs> or is that the um, secret sauce? No, there's no secret. Here. I will share this with you. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I live in Los Angeles, which is a megatropolis beyond megatropolises. I mean, it's like mind bending. It would take an entire lifetime to see it all. Mm -hmm. But other towns are not like that. Like if I go to Boise or or Tulsa or, you know, um, Fort Worth, Texas or whatever, you know, you can always start at first in Maine in the heart of downtown and just start circling. And, you know, I know what I'm looking for and I know what I when I find it. So and I ask a lot of questions, you know, um, and plus I go in kind of half educated, knowing like, you know, I saw this in an old slide, this place or whatever, and I'm pretty sure it's still here. Or I've you know, been a little online or whatever looking for stuff. So I kind of do a little preparation, but I always find myself when I go to these towns, I start asking questions. I, I find one thing like an incredible vintage neon sign or of some sort of a classic car that that person or whoever's around there sometimes often knows more. So I always ask questions, um, you know, is there, what's the oldest donut stand in town? What's the oldest hamburger place? Is there an old hot dog place? Is there any weird, you know, strange museums, extreme architecture? You know, <laughs> what can you point me in the direction of? I, I want to know what's unique about every place I go. I don't want to know what's the same about from where I have just come from. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to your town. Where, where are you at? I'm in Long Beach, so I'm pretty close to L.A. Long Beach. Oh, oh yeah. We'll talk about Long Beach. <laughs> but no, I'm not going to your town, wherever you are. I'm not going there to see what's the same. I'm not going to your town to go to Starbucks. Uh uh. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to your town to go to McDonald's either. Yeah. No. Uh uh. Not unless it's the only bathroom I can find. But um, that's the thing. It's like. <laughs> You know, I'm going to your town to find out, to see what's unique about where you live and what's unique about that place and what the unique treasures are that are there. What makes this town unique? That's what I'm doing. Dude, that's awesome. I love that. I, I, I relate to that so much because that's what I'm always looking forward to is like, I always, I like drive my girlfriend crazy because I never, when we're out, I always want to try like a new different place to eat or something i never just want to do like the mcdonald's or something so i'm always looking for stuff but that's like i don't know maybe this is like the i was born of the wrong generation or it's the millennial in me where like well i have uh i feel like i don't i feel uncomfortable like announcing to people that i'm an out of towner you know what i mean oh no be happy about that be okay. proud all right pridefully i mean d don't try to be what you're not you know, and, and, you know, if, if, I mean, you are an out of towner if you're an out of town. Yeah. Right. 
And I'm telling you, if you say that, if you own it, walk in the door, I'm an out of town or first words out of your mouth when you need to ask a question like you need some sort of assistance or you need knowledge. You know, it's I'm an out of towner. It, it puts them, it psychologically puts that person in a superior place in their mind to you because you know something that they know something that you don't. Mm, okay. And so they all of a sudden swell their ego up and just want to like, you know, like, yeah, I know, you know, I'm, I can be, I can be smart now because I know something you don't, right. you know, they have power over each other. And I'm willing, I'm willing to give them that power because then it gives me the power. I mean, we give each other the power back and forth. We learn from each other. So it's kind of like, you know, I mean, it's not a mind game or anything. It's just, it, it puts that person at ease knowing that you sincerely need to know the answer and they know it and you don't. Right. You know, I don't know. You get what I'm saying? There's a weird thing. But in Long Beach, so can we talk about Long Beach for a little bit? Long Beach, California? Yeah, let's do it. It's kind of a cross between the Brooklyn and the New Jersey of Los Angeles. Okay, right. I can see that. It is. Um, you know, Long Beach has really come into its own in the last few years after decades of just kind of being cast aside and, and just like people pretending it doesn't exist. So, so, so Long Beach, California is a treasure trove of all kinds of attractions and interesting experiences to have. I mean, it's like, it's the Seattle of Southern California as well, because you got water. Yeah. You got water. So it's a, you can do water things. They're like boating. And mm -hmm. how much do we love boating? I know. Um, <laughs> no, there's all kinds of things. Now, have you guys been to, um, one of my favorite, I'll, I'll list off. Do you want to talk about Long Beach a little bit? Yeah, please. I'd love to. Um, well, I mean, I have a special place in my heart for Long Beach because my grandparents moved there in 1939 and they opened a bakery called Geraldine's Pastry Shop. And my, uh, my grandfather opened a paint shop called Redondo Paints. And it's now um, a gay bar called the Silver Fox. That's the building. Oh, yeah. So, I drive by that all the time. What? I drive by that all the time. Yeah, it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the Silver Fox is there, and then the building is my grandfather's paint shop building. But anyway, um, and, the, and the place where they had their bakery was called um, the Wilmore Hotel, and that Wilmore, Ho Wilmore Hotel building is still there in downtown Long Beach. Anyway, enough about that. My dad grew up there. But anyway, it doesn't even matter about that. Long Beach itself, well, it doesn't matter, but Long Beach itself is just such an interesting place. Now, have you guys been to Yonga Ward's Bacon Broil and Bixby Knowles? No. I like to go to places, whether it's an eating place or wherever, that when you walk in the door, you have to go, what decade are we in? I want heart and soul. I want homespun and family run. I want genuine authentic. I want the real deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can appreciate, you know, mass market products like McDonald's and fast food. And that's another whole strain of interesting history and evolution and all of that. But there's nothing that beats homespun and family run. In Long Beach, there are a few old school homespun and family run places that I highly, 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 highly recommend. One is this place in Bixby Knowles, which is the, the one of the more glamorous neighborhoods in all of Long Beach, for yes. sure. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's Bixby Knowles. It's Virginia Country Club, which is the real glamorama. And California Heights. And uh, what's the other area there? I guess those are the three kind of enclave of those three really kind of very exclusive old school neighborhoods. But Yonga Ward's Bake and Broil, it says Bake and Broil right on the front. Okay. Um, it's like this incredible, everything's homemade in there. It's like comfort food. It's the same family serving it up since 1965. They also have baked goods like cakes and cinnamon rolls. And I mean, it's, it's like homemade, like your great grandma would have made this cake. It's not all trying to be all perfect and ying, 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 ying. it is right. just frosting like, you know, like this. And, and the cinnamon rolls are kind of like, you know, they're a little drunken. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> a real deal. And it's like, you know, a dollar extra than going to somewhere that's not the real deal. Mm -hmm. It's only worth it. Bacon broil. You guys are going to love it. It's kind of crowded. You usually have to wait because it's so good and it's not a huge place. Another place I love in Long Beach is Curly's. Which, okay. is in Hill, which is an old diner and bar. Have you heard of Curly's? No, I haven't. Oh, it's your kind of place. They've been serving it up since about 32, 1932. Whoa. And 
um, the specialty of the house there. I mean, of course, it's booze. They open probably 6 a.m. and it's booze all day, but um, there's a lot of beer drinking there. But they also have food. And what I love, the thing that I love there that I've never had anywhere else that's so delicious that I could weep right now even thinking about it, I have to go there as soon as I can, which is, um, they call it the Red Top. It's homemade chili and homemade stew. So they put the stew in a bowl, like half a serving of stew in the bowl, and then they put a scoop of chili on top. <laughs> no one ever thought to put chili and stew together. Wait, you tell me, is that a good combination? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, we got, so we got bacon broil. The other place you, now please tell me you've been to Joe Joe's. Oh, yeah. Bunch of times. Joe's, it's the bar that's been yep. serving since 1924. I mean, this is if you love to really have a genuine, authentic, like time warp experience, go to Joe Jost's in Long Beach, open the door, and you don't know what decade you're in. I mean, that back room with the pool tables and everything, I mean, it's like 1930s in there. Mm -hmm. It's time literally has stood still. Time warps are rare, and I love time warps. So there's that. And then have you been to the Pike, that bar on 4th? Um, I have not. No. Do you know the Pike? The Pike is a fantastic bar. It's newer. It's probably 10 ish years old. Um, they have an incredible sign out front with a big octopus on it. And then you walk inside and it's kind of like the punk rock version of, um, like nautical decor and old vintage Long Beach decor. You know I mean, what? I have been here actually. Yeah. Yeah. Pike. We saw a band play there a couple years ago, actually. It's a fantastic place. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I fall off the chair every time I'm there because I'm so overwhelmed, not by alcohol, but by just the, the, the integrity of the decor and the quality of the ambiance that they've created there. I mean, it's world class. All these places that I'm telling you about world class. That's the thing. It's like what we're looking for here. We're looking for integrity. We're looking for quality. That's what I look for when I'm going out in the world. I, I'm searching for quality things, things that are made with heart and soul, things that things that have lasted the test of time. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we live in this just instant gratification world of like Starbucks and all that, you know, okay, whatever. I mean, they have a good cup of coffee, but I want some, I want some history served up. I want to soothe my soul and nourish my soul with history and stories. What's the story of these places? You know, I mean, it's just, a, it's just so interesting. I mean, it's, it, for me, it's, it's my entertainment also, is just finding out the story and, the, and, and discovering the glory of these places. Um, you know, there's just, it's kind of endless. There's stuff everywhere around every corner where you go, interesting places. In my hometown of Ontario, California, there's several places. Graber Olives, it's this family, the Graber family, where they've been growing, curing, and canning and selling olives since 1894. And if you go to the Graber Olive House, they call it, or Graber Olives, it's like this miniature little kind of... Uh, themed environment where they have this beautiful gift and gourmet shop. It's like early California. It's like 1920s there. It's just beautiful. They show you how they can and cure the olives. They take you on the tour. They have this beautiful gift shop. They have this little museum. They have beautiful artwork. I mean, the whole place, is, it's world class. There's another place in my hometown of Ontario, California that you guys would love, 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 love. Logan's Candies, where they've been making candy since 1933. Whoa. So, okay. I mean, the old candy man died, so there's a new candy man, but he's been there like 35 years or whatever. And he was, he was like a little kid going there, going like, when I grow up, I'm so going to be the candy man here. And voila, he is the candy man there. And he's like the spirited guy that makes the most beautiful spun sugar candies you ever saw, like candy canes and candy cane hearts and candy cane shamrocks and candy cane everything and ribbon candy and all these chocolate candies and chocolate Easter eggs. I mean, it was just Easter a few weeks ago or whenever this was. And I mean, it's all over the top. That's Logan's Candies in Ontario. Vince's Spaghetti, the world's largest roadhouse spaghetti restaurant, homespun and family run, serving it up since 1945. The first thing you notice is the giant neon sign out front, which is a total classic. It has this giant spinning arrow on it and big letters in handwriting, like the font of optimism, like your grandmother's handwriting. It says Vince's Spaghetti. And you go in there, you are like already, once you walk in the door, you're already completely overwhelmed by the smell. Mm -hmm. 
the, the aroma, let's say, not right. smell, sure. the aroma of the spaghetti sauce cooking in the kitchen. And it's the same aroma that I've had in my whole life. It's unbelievable. I mean, not me personally, but that I've experienced when I'm there. But you like get it as soon as you like. You're not even pulled in the parking lot yet. You can already smell it. And the whole place is like classic California casual style. Like it's like total like mid-century classic, classic, classic. I mean, again, heart and soul. There's more there than just eating the food. It's an experience. It's a it's a, it's a love. It's a soul. It's a heart. You mm-hmm. get it? Oh, I got it. Am I blabbing too much? No, this is great. I love it, man. It's so exciting to hear all this stuff. And you have, is this just all in your head or where is, where is all this stuff? Oh, it's completely in my head. Man, we need to get this down. I mean, your books have it, right? Yeah. Holiday Jubilee is in the new one. And here's the other one. It's called Addicted to Americana. And uh, yeah, they're full of all this stuff. I mean, Addicted to Americana. Oh, look at that. I know. <laughs> um, I know. How much do we love classic cars and trailers? Oh, Where yeah. We Please, we weep. But yeah, I mean, the pages are just loaded full of, can you see that? I don't know if you can. Loaded full of all the kind of vintage stuff that we all seriously love. Yes. Addicted to Americana. And uh, that's fun. Uh, you can get it online on my website, charlesphoenix.com. The newest book is Holiday Jubilee, featuring... I also make up recipes in the kitchen using heritage branding products. In this case, um, well, maybe I'll try to show it to you. The Chirpumple is my most famous uh, concoction in the kitchen. And what it is, is it's uh, three pies stuffed in three cakes. Uh, there it is right there. I guess you can see that. <laughs> Cherry and white. Uh, pumpkin and yellow and apple and spice cream cheese frosting that's three three pies and three cakes it's delicious and there i am in the uh, anaheim halloween parade which has been going on since 1922 riding on a giant piece of churp humble <laughs> cherry apple churp humble cherry pumpkin and apple that's why Dude. i tell that anyway this celebrates all the holidays it's so much fun i got i just got to flip through real quick for you so you can kind of get an idea of how colorful and fun it is it's well it's it is trust me yeah oh, i love it Lots of stuff. I mean, you know, I, I, the other thing is I like whimsy. I'll get it out in the open. I like whimsy. I right. do. You know, I mean, I'm not like about fighting and conflict. I like happiness. I like joy. I like, you know, optimism and, and happy, peppy, perky, good times and mm-hmm. all that. So I, I, I live on that side of the street. I live on the sunny side of the street. Right. No, I love it, man. And that's what all like, that's what these, you know, the colors and the architecture and the design and stuff. That's what it feels like. That's what it evokes. I know. Totally. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's the business of optimism, really, is kind of what I really celebrate. And that really happened mostly in the mid-century era. Optimism and good quality. Things made with heart and soul and style. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of my that's kind of my go to. I mean, there's still places now that you can find that, you know, like where you go to a restaurant where it's homespun and family run and stuff. I mean, some heart and soul there. Yeah, so, totally. I'm also in search of layers of time. I love to look through the layers of time. Like in Long Beach is the oldest. I think it's the oldest still standing Taco Bell. It's no longer a Taco Bell. It's I don't know what it's called. I forgot. But it's a it's a Mexican food stand in in the oldest Taco Bell. Taco Bell started in Downey, California in 1962. Speaking of Downey, California, they, which is called the cradle of the cosmic age. We can get into that later. But the <laughs> oldest McDonald's in the world is in Downey. Have you ever been to the oldest McDonald's in the world in Downey? It's in Downey? I No, I didn't uh, realize that. Oldest McDonald's in the world. It's absolutely a mid-century modern masterpiece. The building looks like it could take off for outer space. It's got the giant golden arches on it and this massive, old school style classic neon sign that looks like it belongs on the Las Vegas strip of the 1950s or 60s. So it is quite a, well, it is an, it's a world-class heritage site for sure. Whether it's officially sanctioned that or not, it should be. And it is by me. I mean, you know, really, I mean, you know, McDonald's, whether you like their hamburgers or not, revolutionized the food service industry and architecturally speaking, their original building uh, the original style building that they did is absolutely a mid-century modern masterpiece. So Downey is pretty loaded up with stuff. Um, uh, I mean, there's there's just stuff around every corner, no matter where you go. Everywhere there's there's layers of time to look through, and I have trained my eye to and mind to 
and curiosity to seek these things out. And when I find them, put them up on a pedestal. Um, my Instagram is underscore charlesphoenix.com. My Facebook is Charles Phoenix. Go on there and you'll find all of this stuff. And it's all presented in kind of a fun, you know, kind of a quickie, quickie, goofy, good time, you know, let's just have fun kind of way. I mean, there's so much heavy stuff in the world and I'm not going there. I mean, I, I'm a realist. I'm a realist optimist. That's what I am. So... I, I live in a re world of reality, but I know how to kind of navigate it and always find myself on the sunny side of the street. Nice. Okay. I like that. Yeah, man, your, your Instagram is incredible. It's, it's an hour long scroll. Once you really get into it, it it's crazy. It's so fun. Well, I'm so glad you like it. <laughs> it's just like, you know, so much about this stuff, man. I just want to know, I want to go traveling with what you because I, I feel like you have so much info everywhere we go. What do you want to know? I mean, I, I mean, what what question can I answer for you? What I what I want is to have everything that you know available to me. So, like, if I go to Downey, I know that I where to go. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, that would just be a huge resource. It would just mm -hmm. it's impossible. You know, I see the world like a great big theme park. Every city is a land, and it's my duty to find the attractions and the treasures and the time warps. And I, I got to write that down. That's too good. Uh, <laughs> attractions, I'm writing this down. Attractions, treasures, and time warps. Um, I'm sorry. I, I just got to write that down. No, that's um, every, every land. I mean, every city is like a land. It mm -hmm. is. And the world is the theme park. That's how I look at it. So I love to go on boat rides and train rides and classic, well, classic car rides and, you know, just vehicle, like ride vehicles. I mean, every time I get in my car and get on the freeway, I'm like, this is like Autopia at Disneyland. Whoa. You know, <laughs> because you can't get the person in front of you. Um, <laughs> but I'm also a child of Disneyland. And, you know, Disneyland is really the first place I ever paid attention in my life when I was like, you know, this big. And it hardwired my brain to really like pay attention to style guides and experiences and, and just ambiance and all of that. And that's kind of how I see the whole wide world. Where are, you know, the theme park attraction kind of things, places. So anyway, does all, any of this all make sense? <laughs> no, I love it. It's just so fun, man. I love share like that you share all this stuff and document it and, and, you know, have these books for us to check out. Cause yeah, like I love, I, I interviewed the new owners of the, of Randy's donuts who bought that place. And like, I, I love this stuff too. Well, by the way, we might as well get it out in the open about Randy's seriously. <laughs> ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. You know, Randy's by LAX. Yeah. Big giant donut on top of the roof. Iconic. That, yeah. that built, yeah, that building, that iconic building. Um, in my opinion, seriously, not joking around, is the single most important commercial, well, let's say retail building of the 20th century. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's how important that is culturally. That giant donut sitting on this little outer space age style, like mid-century modern. Mm -hmm. For follows function, drive, drive through. It's a drive through. You can walk up or drive through there. But, I mean, absolutely. That is that is like the greatest single best retail structure, the most important on of the 20th century that I will go to my grave. OK, I think I and could agree with that. All Tommy's up and tell him. I mean, Tommy's Randy's. There's also Tommy's. Tommy's hamburgers. That's another thing. Unrelated. I don't even know why I said that. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Randy's, Randy's, Randy's. So I went to Randy's Donuts a few years ago and I said, excuse me, like, um, who is Randy and where is Randy? Right. I asked and they said, well, uh, Randy's my cousin and the owner uh, at that time. It just had recently changed hands in the last couple of years. But the owner at that time said um, his cousin is Randy and he hasn't seen him in 20 years and he lives in Lancaster. And I said, like, what's the story of Randy's? Like, you and your brother own this place? Again, former owners of who currently owns Randy's. But um, he said, my brother and I own this place, and my uncle bought it in, I think he said 1973, but I could be wrong about the year. But anyway, he said the uncle was in driving by and witnessed a car crash into Randy's donuts. 
What? And at the time, it was called the Big Donut Drive-In. It was a part of a chain. There were nine Big Donuts. There are four of them still left, by the way. Um, did you know that? I did, yeah. My dad actually worked at one of those Big Donuts. You did? My dad did, yeah. Oh, uh, well, that's that's Americana royalty right there. Yeah. <laughs> Put a crown on him and give him a donut and say, you're Americana royalty. But anyway, so um, he, the, the guy who owned Randy's, you know, for decades, a few years ago, told me that his uncle bought it after he witnessed a car crash into the building. And he approached the owners after the car crashed into the building and said, you know, like, gosh, car crashed in your building. You must be time. It must be time for you guys to retire. And they're like, we'll sell it to you. We'll sell it to you. So that's the story that I got. Um, that's the way that the second owner got Randy's Donuts. So, yeah, Randy's Donuts. I'm a huge, huge fan. I love donuts. I have a special Sunday morning recipe or a party food recipe, which is you get a dozen donuts. You, like, get, let them be a day old. You smash them down. Smash the donuts down. Smash them down good. You can run over them with a car. Stomp them on, stomp on them with your foot. But you have to put plastic, you know, put them in a Ziploc or whatever first before you run over them or smash them down. And then you treat them like um, French toast. Oh, oh, you tell me that's not delicious. French toast. It's called smashed donut French toast. And so you make French toast out of smashed donuts. I'm telling you, your life will never be the same. Wow. Man, There's, man. Yeah. And then, and then I, did, I saw you like deep frying cereal or frying cereal or something. Fried cereal, not deep fried cereal. Fried cereal is easy. What you do is you have to get the puff cereals like Fruit Loops and Apple Jacks and Trix and uh, Honeycombs. Those are all puff cereals. You can't do the flake cereals, but you get your favorite puff cereals, like about five or six of them. And you, for every like cup of cereal or every box of cereal, have like a cup of butter. I mean, a, um, a half a stick of a stick of butter, a stick of butter. Sorry, I'm like off my mind. <laughs> And you basically just melt the butter, salted butter. You melt it in an electric skillet, and you just just kind of pour in the cereal, and then you make sure it's coated with butter, and then you pour it, put put it in a bowl or whatever. And the weird thing is, is the butter does not change the crisp of the cereal; it just soaks in. So it's nothing, you know, like good cereal is just with milk. Mm-hmm. Well, imagine it taken to like 40 layers above that, 40 levels above that with salted butter soaked into it. It's ecstasy. It's like a finger food. And if you mix all the colorful ones together, like Fruit Loops and Tricks and Apple Jacks and Honeycombs, you, and you have all these, you know, it's a multi-textural. It's gorgeous. That is fried cereal is a recipe in my holiday Jubilee book. And I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. Please do. And, um, yeah, I'll show it to you. And it is I, in the book. I, I had to change the name because I, I have it as a, a um, New Year's Eve snack, but it's called fried confetti. And here's the recipe right here. And that's what it looks like in the bowl. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see it. Man, oh, man. I mean, no, that's fried cereal. That's good. It's not deep fried. It's more like sauteed, actually. OK, but, sauteed uh, cereal. There you go. And you cannot stop eating it. I mean, that's the only problem with it. Man, fried I confetti. gotta try that. Yeah, you'll love it. Wow. Man, Charles, this is crazy. So what I know. Oh, sorry. Our door. Someone knocked on our door. Um, That's okay. It's OK. Um, so I, I think I saw you driving around in a, like a newer Challenger. Is that yes. right? Okay. Yes. I had one of those, too. I got one in, in 2012 and just loved it. It was awesome. What happened? I had to sell it. It was just too high. I had a black, it was a black one and it was just like, I didn't have to sell it, but it just became too much maintenance for me to like keep up. And I was parking on the street. I just needed something more practical. So I got a Jeep. You mean the black paint? Yeah. Got dirty every day. Yeah. Every single yeah, day. Yeah, that's the problem with black paint. Yeah. So it was great. Loved it. But life's easier with just the Jeep. Looks good dirty, you know? Right. Um, but my question is, what do you think about, cause like, I love appreciating this old stuff and we can and look at it and still enjoy it and everything. But what do you think about like, what kind of newer stuff is being created on this level? Or is it just, you know, like the, I love the challenger, but is it just a, are they just copying the past? Well, I'll tell you, no, I mean, they're being inspired by the past. I mean, they're just trying to make a product that people are going to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, another product that people are going to buy. Um, yeah, we're kind of phasing out the, I mean, we're probably not going to get any more heritage design vehicles. I'm predicting Okay. Um, cars are going to become more and more and more homogenous looking. Um, I mean, that's just kind of the way that business is going. I mean, fashion is becoming more that way. I mean, good 
you know, I mean, unique design is, is becoming kind of a luxury and not a, uh, you know, not a, uh, you know, not a, I mean, it's just not everyday stuff anymore. So I don't even know what I'm saying, but all right. Um, Justin? I mean, that was good. It, yeah. It's just, I'm just curious what's, yeah. Is stuff being built the same way it was? Day is interesting. Is that what you said? You know, I'm not, you know, I don't really, I'm not, I'm not dedicated to figuring that out. And, and you know, I'm, I mean, if something pops up in front of me, I guess I would notice it, but I thought so. But I'm really dedicated my life to the study of mid-century and, and celebrating mid-century American life and style. And so I, it's such a massive undertaking to grasp it and go down all these rabbit holes. I mean, there are so many, but I don't really have time to kind of think about that, you know, what's unique about today's world. I mean, I mean, there are some things, I suppose, I mean, you know, like I'm sure there's going to be, you know, like a Starbucks collector and there already are people are like, I have 48 Starbucks mugs. Right. You know? Sure. Yeah. Not really that interested in that, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's fair, man. You found your, the stuff that you love and that's what you're interested in. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, no, this is super fun, Charles. Like, it's awesome to hear all this and and go through this and that you were able to kind of create a whole career and show out of this. It's so fun, man. I love it. Yeah. I mean, the real takeaway here is that we live in a wonderland to discover and there's something interesting or unique and, and soulful and heartful and authentic and genuine around almost every corner, no matter where you go. So I always look for the beauty, look for the quality, look for the heart and soul. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of training yourself to, to see between, you know, to find it. But, you know, when you find it, you know it because you can feel it right, right in your gut. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, for me, a big part of the joy of life. Right. Journey. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I feel like I'm on the path. I'm not to your level yet, but I'm getting there. I'm working on it. Well, you know, they didn't build Rome in a day either. So as they say, so just keep going. I mean, we learn every day. We discover every day, every day. There's something like, what, how did I not know about that? You know, or whatever. I mean, just driving around in the car, like looking at architecture and buildings and neighborhoods and houses and apartments and commercial buildings and signs and fonts and colors. Mm hmm. Guy, I mean, just everything. Just look. I mean, I am a visual person, and that's kind of helps me to be able to do this. For right. Sure. Cool. Okay, so charlesphoenix.com. That's where everything's at, right? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, so it's on there. The books, the videos, social media links. So I'll, I'll throw that the link to charlesphoenix.com in the description so people listening can click on that and, and find you easily, all right? Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, thanks, Charles, again. I really appreciate you coming on, and and it was a fun, fun chat, so thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Travis DeRose. Well, there you have it. Episode 81 is come and gone. Hope you enjoyed it. It was a fun conversation. I hope you had fun listening to that with Charles Phoenix, and thanks again, Charles, for being on. Um, Thank you for being here and listening to the end, and... Don't forget, I mentioned before, we got a giveaway going on. A We're giving away Charles's book, Addicted to Americana, for free. You just enter your information because I got to know how to get a hold of you if you win. And then I'll send you the book for free. That's it. So head over to curiosityness.com slash giveaway to check that out. And it's on now. If you're listening to this, when this comes out, it's available now. You can go enter, but it's going to end on May 18th. So hurry up and go over there and enter the giveaway. Um, That's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks again for listening. I'm Travis DeRose. This is Curiosityness, curiosityness curiosityness.com. Uh, Instagram at Trav DeRose. Send me an email to Travis at curiosityness.com for tips and feedback and thoughts and opinions and ideas for new guests. All that kind of stuff is good. Um, That's all I got to say. Thanks for being here and I'll see you in episode 82. Bye-bye.